Moreover, we can induce a number of neuromicrobiological agents to then incur something called high morbidity. These are not necessarily mortal agents. We can modify the existing palette of bacteria and viruses through the use of gene editing techniques, very viable. This has been some of my ongoing work with my colleague Diane Deulis at National Defense University. And what we can also do is recognize that there are existing microbiologicals that can be harnessed to then induce the effects. We can also engage certain chemicals that way. What we want here is a morbidity factor, not necessarily a mortality factor. I want to make people sick. And what I do here is the virus is not necessarily the bug. The virus is what I put over the internet. Let me show you how I can crash a system pretty easily. I affect key individuals here, here, and here. And then I take another community in the back of the room. I affect key individuals there. And then I take another community. And I affect key individuals there. And then I do what every good attributional group does. I beat my chest and take credit for it. And what I put out over the internet is, this is a virus, a bacteria, an agent that I have infiltrated into your fill in the blank. I say it's a weapon of mass destruction. And what I tell you it's going to do is it's going to produce paranoia, anxiety, and sleeplessness. What I've just done is I've recruited every paranoid hypochondriac to think that they have whatever that is. I've used salient and sentinel cases. And I create, essentially, a legion of what's known as the worried well. They now flood emergency rooms. They flood their clinicians. The CDC responds back and says, no, 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 there is no such a thing. And I've created a schism of trust between the population and the polis. It's both a short and a long war's effect. Moreover, I can create particular neuromicrobiologicals that may have a much longer duration of action. For example, modified Zika virus. And what I can then do is, as a consequence of that, is I can affect subsequent generations who incur a public health morbidity and mortality effect that then creates an increased economic and perhaps social burden. Long war scenario. If I wanted to do something that's a little bit more proximate, I can utilize nanoparticulate matter. Now, we can utilize nanoscience to create much better drugs to get them where they got to go in the brain. I can create nanoscience and nanotechnology to be able to escort certain drugs across the proliferant barrier, which is the blood-brain barrier and blood uh, cerebrospinal fluid barrier. So I get these things where they got to go. But I can also utilize nanoparticulate matter in a very indiscriminate way. The idea here is that I can get something called high CNS aggregation material that is essentially invisible to the naked eye and even to most scanners because it is so small that it selectively goes through most levels of filter porosity. These are then inhaled, either through the nasal mucosa or absorbed through the oral mucosa. They have high CNS affinity. They clump in the brain or in the vasculature. And they create, essentially, what looks like a hemorrhagic diathesis, in other words, a hemorrhage predisposition or a clot predisposition in the brain. What I've done is I've created a stroking agent. And it's very, very difficult to gain attribution to do that. I can use that on a variety of levels, from the individual to the group, highly disruptive. And in fact, this is one of the things that has been entertained and examined to some extent by my colleagues in NATO and to those who are working on the worst use of neurobiological sciences to create populational disruption. Very, very worried about the potential for these nanoparticulate agents to be CNS aggregating agents to cause neural disruption, either as hemorrhagic and vascular disruptors or as actual neural network disruptors because they interfere with the network properties of various neural nodes and systems within the brain. Then I get to the area of devices. And this, in many ways, is going to be less than definitive. The reason for this is this is highly evolving and I think is limited only in certain cases by context of imagination. What are the devices? Well, I have them here for you here. You have neurosensory mobilizing agents. And to some extent, some of these have already been used. Uh, things like high output sensory stimulators that can be administered from unmanned vehicles, drones, insect borne, or uh, larger scale, macro scale vehicles such as tanks, cars, etc. These are sensory mobilizing agents that use high electromagnetic pulse energy that may also utilize high levels of sound, high levels of, of light energy, and they disrupt neurological sensory function. Already being used, now they're being developed with higher specificity. The idea of intracranial pulse stimulators take this one step further. Now the idea is to utilize direct electromagnetic pulses to be able to disrupt neural network aggregation. There have been some animal studies that have been done that look at the viability of electromagnetic pulses across various distances to essentially disrupt the network properties of the brain and create confusional models. So these are both individual and group disruptors. You also have the idea of the altered reality tactics that is primarily used in irregular warfare. 
And here, once again, when we understand the, the construct of the way neural networks operate, they operate by key controller and influencing nodes that interact with other neural networks within the brain electrochemically. If we can utilize transcranial mechanisms to be able to disrupt this, what we can do is we can create disrupted neural network aggregation and literally disrupt people's sense of time, space, and place.